do you have a hope that there could be a bigger societal changes that could lead to permanent structural systemic change? There will be. The Nigerian state can lie to itself all it wants. It's elites and uh, purchased talking eggs mm. can also go ahead and be making permutations as they care. What they have all forgotten is that however long the light travels, it will come to where the truth stands. There are definitely going to be changes. It's inevitable. You don't... For anyone who is thinking that his business as usual, is just fooling himself. Right now, what you have it's a boiling pot. It's boiling. Pressure cooker. Mm. Hmm? At some point, if you don't find a way to let out the steam, it will explode. The Nigerian youth, who were the primary movers of the NSAS protests, people like us were just there looking at them because we were not involved. We were just looking at them shocked that we were talking to our own mates, the people we fought the military with, my own age mates, my, the middle class, the Nigerian middle class. Those were the people we were always talking to. We were always talking down at the NSAS boys and girls. We were always thinking that these ones, they don't understand the issue. We never connected them to the issues. But they rose up. As one, across the country, the state actually had to find ways to douse the other parts. I remember protests in the north where people were carrying placards upside down because they had been paid to come and so carry placards. Like it's because they were trying to get ahead of those protesters, compromise them before they could understand the issues. If they were not afraid of them, they would not be organizing them into a rent a crowd. You, you, you talked about that time too. I mean, bring the middle class, so to say, uh, you know, to support uh, the, the, the protesters or the young, young ones no, no, at that no, point. No, no, no. I, I no, no. The, what I'm saying is, when my own generation, exactly that generation, when we were talking, and I'm not talking about the NSAS protests, exactly. I'm saying that all our works, our exertions, whether we're writing, whether we're talking, what we've been doing, is that we've been speaking to our own selves. We've been speaking in silos. But but there seems to be a lethargy from that generation, from that generation. There's not lethargy. Uh, because, you, because, uh, you know, this is all about courage, for example, no, so, so to say. No, no. Uh, have, have this gener have that generation been cowed, so to say? Mm -hmm. I mean, because it, it's quite unfortunate that we, we, we're not having much uh, constructive criti critical, uh, you know, discussion centered on you know, around those issues being addressed by that generation, so to speak. And uh, what role do, does courage play in uh, having more critics I, of I, that generation speak more on these issues? No, I think you misunderstand the issues, and I will explain myself. Please do. My generation fought. We understand that. We fought all through our teenage years. We fought well into our late 20s, 20s. early 30s, 30s, before the military left. Yeah. When the military left, or say by the time the military left, they had done sufficient damage to the psyche of my generation. We were the sap generation. Exactly. We were the generation that had our bread without butter. <laughs> We were the ones who ate our yam with salt and palm oil. Mm. We were the essential commodity generation. We killed for everything. So by the time we started having children, we were growing up in a society that had been destroyed because there, was, there were no longer public education institutions sure. the system was the system was already dying as we were growing up yeah. but by the time we started having children it was dead hmm. but we stepped into the void our children started going to private schools from primary school we started facing existential bills so my class my generation fell into the trap 
of taking over from the failure of the state, mm. we became our own presidents in our home. So you had to provide your own electricity, your own water. We became, I'm just laying the foundation yeah. for you to understand mm. that we took our eyes off the community because the community had already been destroyed mm. and we had learned to accept the failure of the community, which in this case is the state. Mm. So we don't question the state. We simply stepped into the gap and started plugging the holes. So you found that we became more and more materialistic as a generation because we became survivalists. Mm. So by the time the state was failing, our children, we had cushioned them from the worst effect of it and we mm -hmm. became just focused on making sure that we kept doing that. Our children will look at us, but they wouldn't understand. And I'll tell you why they wouldn't understand. Our generation grew up on hope. Yeah. My generation, we grew up with hope. We were our parents' hope. Mm. Our parents invested their hopes in mm. us. Then. We were given hope. You are the leaders of tomorrow, mm. we were told. Mm. Nigeria will be great by the year 2000. We were the 2000 generation. I'm 53 now. In 2000, I was in my 30s. So, as at that time, the belief was that we were the future. So it was easy for us to accept the failures because we had always lived with it. But we were hopeful. My generation didn't want to die. So we did not confront the Nigerian state the way this generation has faced it. My generation had hope. This generation is patently hopeless. They can, all they see are debts, hmm. piling up, rulers living large, impunity strolling in the land, SARS killing and harassing them. So it wasn't easy for their generation to accept the oppression that our own generation has taken as normal. Mm. The like of Yeli is rare in my generation. Mm. How many Yelis are in my generation? He's unique in my generation. He's been consistently rebellious. Consistently. Some of us found accommodation for the system in seeking to cushion the effect of his failure. We didn't realize on time that it remained as immoral and bankrupt as it was in our youth. So when you talk about my generation, it's not cowardice. Mm. That generation fought to gain the illusion of democracy. Mm. Each generation will fight its own battles. This generation has fought and I believe it will take this to a logical conclusion, but it has gained something we never gained. It stripped this evil system naked. As I was researching for this interview, um, I will actually listen to one of your recent presentation that was at the celebration. And when you're concluding remarks uh, at the celebration, fellow debates, yeah. you made the statements that those who have the intentions or the illusions of uh, having elections in 2023 should also have the intention that uh, some of us that will ensure that there is no elections until we have a restructure. Uh, that's some strong words. I mean, how, how do you intend to do that? Thank you. So, yeah, when the facts are agreed, when the truth has been established okay. and the facts are agreed, what you find is that the battle becomes a battle of narratives. That is where we are in Nigeria at this time, is a battle of narratives. Mm. The system would like everybody to believe that the problem right now is Buhari. Mm -hmm. Even we, who should know better, we help them to reinforce that lie because we focus so much on the person of Buhari. And it's easy to focus on because mm -hmm. it's everything that is bad about the Absolutely. system. Mm -hmm. But 
The problem is not Buhari. The problem is not Sonwolu. The problem is not your governor or your House of Assembly person. No. The problem is the system that they have to work with. But the beneficiaries of the system are not going to be the ones to point Nigerians in the direction of the problem. It will be left to those of us who believe that we are correct in identifying the system as the problem to take the narrative to the Nigerian people to let them understand that however much you might change personnel, if you do not change this system, Nigeria will not change and it will only continue regressing. What people, you see, when I speak about the constancy of truth, what people tend to forget is that just because you have refused to teach history, it does not mean that you can erase it. There is a basis for the existence of Nigeria. The only reason Nigeria ever came into being was that in 1954, I believe, there was an agreement amongst all the principal, all the principal parties in the regions that we would have a federal constitution that each region will be able to run its things as it pleases. All this shenanigan where we can't tell what our population is, mm -hmm. is because of the many lies that we have been telling ourselves for decades. All this shenanigan of national ID card is because we have taken a, we have moved away from being a federation into a centralized system where you are trying to import foreigners to come and dilute local populations. All this demand for cattle root, ruga and everything is just nonsense. So until we revert back to our federalist route, where we clearly understand that the basis of our existence is in mutual respect for our diversity, we are wasting time by trying to change governors, changing meaning. What difference does it make? What you would even find is that, as with everything perverse, the more it reproduces, the more perversion it bats. Look at it this way. They brought that lie in 1999. It threw up the Obasanjo monster. Obasanjo, with all his monstrosities, today, believe it or not, it remains the model for the system they are trying to practice. And yet, he was a tyrant. So you find that you started with what you thought was the worst that could be produced. And then you had a Yaradwa, who barely stayed long enough to leave any impression and is today romanticized. And then you brought an Ebele. The shoeless one that began to own a shoe factory. And then what came after that one? This monster called Buari. I'm telling you this, and let people go and write this down. When the best is corrupted, it produces the worst. Buari's simplicity makes it easy to see the evil that it does. If somebody like El Rufai wow. or Fashola or that one in Ekiti, uh, Fire mm -hmm. Me, those intelligent ones, if they ever gain power under this constitution, we are in trouble. Mm -hmm. You have already seen the beginning of a one party state, a one party system is already emerging with Buhari and his complete disregard for at any pretense for adherence to the rule of law. Mm. I tell you, you go into that 2023 election, the APC will give you a moonslide. Mm. And when it gives you a moonslide, it will be a moonslide victory. When it gives you that moonslide victory, what will simply happen is, who is going to oppose it? PDP. All of them will move, the remaining ones, you see them moving to APC, and then you tell me who and who are going to be fighting in 2027. Mm. Let people get it into their head. 
if we make the error of allowing the APC and the political class to consolidate the unconscionable powers that it is already wielding over all of us by having an election in 2023, Nigerians should just be prepared that this pretense of a democracy, they will stop pretending. But the, the, the big question is, do, do we have, at this point in time, yeah. a sustained, determined, critical mass of the Nigerian people to demand and, you know... What I will say to you is this. Get this meaningful uh, change. You know, you forced me out. You forced me out in the sense that I, I tend to take time before coming to the public with a position. Because I might be thinking through something for years or months or weeks, depending on the subject, before venturing an opinion. Me, I know, as clear as daylight, that the true Nigerian revolution is the movement of the people to stand against business as usual in 2023. In the absence of guns, which I don't know how to carry them, in the absence of violence, the only game in town is a mass mobilization of the Nigerian people in demand of substantive structural changes before any elections might be held in 2023. Now, when you talk about sufficient time being had or any work, I tell you something. The Nigerian people themselves are not unaware of the fact that we are at an inflection point in our history and something needs to be done. And I will say to you, in my own small capacity, in my own little corner of this country, I am speaking across channels to different people in different organizations and I know that there is a call, there is a current ongoing consultation across the board and across the channels and the position that is coming through from most of these consultations is that there should be a principled broad-based movement against any election in 2023 in the absence of substantive restructuring of the Nigerian state. Now, question is, are the Nigerian people themselves ready? I believe they are. If you have not given the people an alternative to what you are protesting against, you cannot say that they have not connected. If they have disconnected from a system, as they have done, where you have less than 30 million people voting at any national election since 1999, in spite of the inflation of votes and everything, in spite of ghost voters, underage voters and everything, you've had less than 30 million Nigerians voting. Let's even accept that they are, we, are, we really aren't up to the 200 and something and we are really maybe just about 150 million people because there is actually a lie inflating our population. 30 million is too small for you to say that the people are involved. But their alienation from the system is because they see nothing changing by their participation. But if you offer them a real change and you can mobilize them around it and then they fail to connect, then we then have the right to say, well, history absolved me. We did offer them an alternative. They are the ones who refused to come along. And you see, we must understand anyone who is anchoring after change, speaking to change, we must understand we do not have a monopoly of ideas. Just because we think that the government is wrong and the system is wrong does not make it wrong. And even if it is wrong and the people decide that they are happy with it the way it is, we must also learn to accept the tyranny of the majority. 
But without placing at our own ideas in the marketplace of ideas, we cannot say whether the people would have come along or not. Our own view is that those ideas have to be placed before them and we will recommend that they come along. Finally, we've seen in recent times the attempt by this government to clamp down on uh, the memorial, NSA's uh, memorial. Uh, we had recently that landmark event center I had to cancel uh, the events, and we've had instances where the Nigerian police has also come forward. We've seen the crass you know, impunity of this government uh, and its clamp down uh, the civic space, uh, as a matter of fact. Now, the question we would like you to answer at this point in time is, are we going to see more of this pro protest in the near future? You see, I have... I've said this on record already. I've learned not to presume to know what is best for the oppressed when it comes to an expression of um, their rejection of the oppression. So I will not presume to tell anyone they shouldn't go out to protest. In fact, if anything, I would encourage them to go right ahead and express every one of their God-given rights. And the right to peaceful protest is fundamental to a democracy. So that the Nigerian state would react with violence is predictable. There is no, it doesn't take, they don't even need to advertise it, but it's also quite comforting to see the brazenness with which somebody like Akim Odumosu came to the press to be issuing threats and everything. is nice. History will remember what each and every one of us have done. The accounting on the triumph of impunity over time. But that's a bad calculation they are all making. At some point, there will be an account. And each person would definitely render an account for what they have done. The law is clear. The Nigerian has the right to peaceful assembly. The Nigerian police has an obligation to provide protection to peaceful protesters. That is in an ideal world. But I wouldn't be saying anything new when I say that Nigeria is not governed by law. It is governed by impunity. And that is why you would have a commissioner of police issuing the kind of threats and statements that Akim Odumosu has been issuing. In the absence of the enforcement of law, since we are not a, a nation of laws, what does the police enforce? Impunity. So when you hear the impunity of Mr. Odumosu and those of other functionaries of government, speaking as though we were in a military dictatorship mm. and issuing threats and landmark shame on them. Mm. But they are businessmen as well. And when the state might, okay, if you are talking about landmark, what do we say about Arise? Exactly. No, but let, let's say it. At the end of the day, you invited a man and then you disinvited him. Mm. It's... Um, it speaks volume as to where we are as a people. Yeah, you might have the freedom of speech. Is your freedom after the speech that I cannot guarantee? Idea millions in Nigeria. Thank you so much for your time. Always a pleasure. We appreciate your